un invito ai giovani a conoscere le conseguenze distruttive di una guerra nucleare, i giovani nelle scuole. Sono Mario Giacanelli, presidente onorario di International Physician Preventing Nuclear War, affiliata di International Campaign Antinucleare. Abbiamo ricevuto due premi Nobel, conseguentemente l'ONU ha decretato il trattato di proibizione delle armi nucleari, il TPNA. Io ritengo necessario far conoscere per prevenire le conseguenze distruttive di una guerra nucleare. Ricordo le conseguenze su Mururoa, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, la guerra dei Balcani e nell'Iraq con l'uranio impoverito o detected uranium. In particolare ricordo l'importanza di considerare l'inferno nucleare come la distruzione climatica e del globo terrestre e consiglio di, di leggere una citazione scientifica, una previsione scientifica di Earth Future di Michael John. I want to talk to you today about the medical consequences of nuclear war. Since the end of the Cold War, we have acted as though the problem of nuclear war has gone away. Unfortunately, it hasn't. There remain in the world today nearly 20,000 nuclear warheads, the vast majority, 95%, in the arsenals of the United States and Russia. And so it is terribly important that we understand what will happen if these weapons are used. During the Cold War, we all understood that if there was a large war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, it would be a disaster not just for them, but for the entire planet. In recent years, we have come to understand that even a much more limited nuclear war, as might take place between India and Pakistan, would also be a disaster for all humanity. We have examined a scenario in which India and Pakistan fight uh, using about 50 Hiroshima-sized bombs on either side, with these weapons targeted at urban areas. The immediate consequences in South Asia are catastrophic. Something between 20 and 30 million people die in the first few weeks from radiation, from fire, from blast. But as horrific as these local consequences are, it's the global climate disruption that is really terrifying. Because it turns out that the firestorms started by these weapons cause more than 5 million tons of debris to be lofted into the upper atmosphere where they block out sunlight causing temperatures across the planet to drop an average of 1.3 degrees centigrade. This shortens the growing season, cuts down on precipitation, and this disrupts food production. In the last year, we have learned that under this scenario, U.S. corn production would fall about 12%, and this decline would last for a full decade. Chinese middle season rice production would drop nearly 15%, and this too would persist for a whole decade. And some preliminary studies that are just now being done suggest that corn production in China and wheat production in China might drop even more. The world is very ill-prepared at this time to deal with this kind of decline in food production. The granaries of the world hold only a reserve amounting to about 70 days of consumption, and this simply would not be an adequate buffer. In addition, there are 870 million people in the world who are malnourished today at baseline. These people receive less than 1,800 calories a day. This is just enough to maintain their body mass and to let them do a little bit of work to gather food, to grow food. There are also 300 million people in the world who get pretty good nutrition today, but live in countries that are very dependent on food imports. In the event of a limited nuclear war and a significant decline in food production, all of these people, more than a billion people total, would be at risk of starvation. Within a thousandth of a second of the detonation of this bomb, a fireball would form, reaching out for two miles in every direction, four miles across. Within this area, temperatures would rise to 20 million degrees Fahrenheit, which is hotter than the surface of the sun, and everything would be vaporized. The buildings, the people, the trees, the upper level of the earth itself. To a distance of four miles in every direction, the blast would generate winds in excess of 600 miles per hour and blast pressures greater than 25 pounds per square inch. 
Forces of this magnitude can destroy anything that human beings can build. Underground shelters would collapse. To a distance of six miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that automobile sheet metal would melt. To a distance of 10 miles in every direction, the blast would still generate winds in excess of 200 miles per hour and blast pressures greater than 10 pounds per square inch. Forces of this magnitude would level wood frame buildings, masonry buildings. A modern steel and concrete building would see its walls and floors swept out. Just the steel skeleton would remain. To a distance of 16 miles in every direction, the heat would be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Wood, paper, cloth, heating oil, gasoline, it would all ignite. Hundreds of thousands of fires, which would, over the next half hour, coalesce into a giant firestorm, 32 miles across, covering over 800 square miles. Within this entire area, the temperature would rise to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. All the oxygen would be consumed, and every living thing would die. Beyond this great firestorm, the destruction would continue, and there would be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, suffering severe injuries, crush injuries, penetrating injuries, extensive burns, blindness from retinal burning. All of these people would need intensive medical care, but it would not be available because most of the hospitals would be destroyed, most of the doctors and nurses and other health professionals would be dead, there'd be no electricity to run the ventilators and the cardiac monitors, most of the medical supplies would be exhausted within hours. And the vast majority of these people would not receive any medical care at all. They would die alone and in great pain. $72.6 billion. That's how much the nine nuclear armed states spent on nuclear weapons in 2020. Taxpayer money during the worst global pandemic in a century, financing weapons of mass destruction. Although most countries support a global ban on nuclear weapons, these countries and companies spend billions to keep nuclear weapons in business. 
$72.6 billion for government agencies and private companies that build nuclear weapons. These companies fund major think tanks that write about nuclear weapons and hire lobbyists to make sure policymakers approve enormous nuclear weapon budgets the next year. This is the nuclear weapon funding cycle, a shadowy interplay between governments, private companies, think tanks, and lobbyists, all complicit in today's massive stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction. It's time to stop the cycle. It's time for the ban.